record recording recording is in uh, progress so that we can be sure uh, to have an accurate representation of this meeting and that we can uh, make sure to capture your questions and any comments that come through. So here's a little bit of an outline of how this will go this evening. We are having a webinar. So folks who are attending, we can't see you or hear you, but hopefully you can see and hear us. You may just be seeing me right now, but you'll hear from a number of folks and we'll take a second to introduce our panelists in just a second. Uh, we've enabled our Q&A function this evening. So if you're tuning in on uh, a computer, that's probably at the bottom of your screen. There's a little box that says Q&A and uh, you can type in your questions and we'll be answering those. Some of them will be answered uh, live. I'll help moderate them when we get to our Q&A portion and some of our team members may be verbally answering your questions as well. So we'll be taking those. I'd ask if possible, if you can hold your questions until we get to the Q&A part. Some of your questions may be answered during our presentation, uh, but that's enabled and uh, we'll be looking forward to hearing from you and getting your questions uh, very soon. I'm gonna pass it over to our panelists in just a minute to uh, introduce themselves. And then we're gonna get started walking you through where designs are at right now for the Recreation and Aquatic Center. We had a meeting, uh, not time seems like it doesn't exist anymore for me, but it was very not too long ago, a week ago, uh, with neighbors and uh, some of the members of the neighborhood associations immediately next to the site. Uh, so if some of the neighbors are here, we're glad that you're joining us again uh, and excited to hear some of the feedback. Some of the questions that were raised in that first meeting with uh, the neighborhood association will be weaving into our presentation tonight, uh, but we look forward to um, addressing your concerns hearing what excites you, what you're interested in knowing more about, and hopefully answering your questions about the Recreation and Aquatic Center. Okay, um, there may be some questions that we're not able to answer. That's okay. We're gonna have a record of your uh, questions that are asked in Zoom, and uh, we'll be noting any of those that we're not able to answer and uh, can compile those and note any that may need additional follow-up after this meeting. So my panelists tonight will do our best to answer as many of those as possible, but if it's just simply that something that we can't answer right now, we'll tell you why, and then be sure to capture that question in our meeting summary. Uh, my colleague Ariella is here this evening. Ariella Frischberg is available. If you have any technical issues or something's looking weird, I'm going to enable the chat um, so that folks can chat with her just in case something strange is going on technically, uh, and then we'll close it down and focus on our Q&A for the evening. So panelists, good evening. If you can, uh, I'll help moderate us, but if you can tell us your name and uh, who you work for, who you're representing this evening and your role on the project, and then I'll pass it over to you to get us started. So let's start, let's start with Jan. Hello, Jan. Hello, good evening, everyone. I am Jan Wirtz and I'm the Deputy Director for Lake Oswego Parks and Recreation. And my role with this project is to um, look at all the spaces for recreation needs and just ensure that um, the community has what you need and what you want. Thanks, Jan. Glad that you're here. Let's go over to our architectural team. Let's start with Jennifer and then go to Sid and Erica. Hi, I'm Jennifer with Scott Edwards Architecture and I'm the project manager on this on the project. And my name is Sid Scott. I'm principal for the project with Scott Edwards Architecture. Erica Baggin with Scott Edwards Architecture. I'm the project architect. And let's say good evening to Ken. Hi there, everyone. Um, Ken Reams with PBS Engineering and Environmental. I am the, a civil engineer and representing the traffic and parking studies that were done for several of the, the parks projects. Thanks, Ken. And my name is Allison Brown, and I uh, am a facilitator with JLA Public Involvement. I've been supporting the team facilitating meetings like this. So I'll be your facilitator and moderator tonight. And I am joined, she can, she's going to stay off camera, but by my colleague, Ariella Frischberg. Oh, there she is. Hello. <laughs> Ariella, do you want to say hi? Hello. I'm here um, to answer questions um, and do some note taking. Um, so we will definitely have a record of all of your questions and anything that we can't answer tonight will be uh, sent out later. Thanks, Ariella. I'm glad that you're here. And she'll be helping with any Zoom logistics in the background. So uh, very excited to get right into it. So folks, I think let's get started with our presentation and uh, 
folks out there in the audience, if you have any burning questions that you'd like to get into the Q&A box straight away, go for it. If you want to hold those until we get to the Q&A portion, your question may be answered during our uh, presentation, but we'll look forward to, uh, to taking those then. Okay, I think we're maybe joined by one other person, maybe not. Is, is it Bruce? I don't know. We're going to find out. Let's go ahead and get our PowerPoint up while we uh, sort out who our mystery final panelist is. Uh, and we'll have them introduce themselves uh, when it's sorted out. All right, you're seeing that? Yes. Yep, that looks good. All right, should we get started? Yeah, let's go ahead and get started. All right. Um, so I went back, it's actually it was the end of February that we held our community meeting, not in March. So I was surprised also, I thought they were both in March. <laughs> February, it's been yes. a minute. It's been a while. So, so yeah, since that time, a lot has happened. Um, so we progressed through the schematic design phase. And at that point, we um, showed three options and their costs to the city council. Uh, that happened in June, and they selected uh, moving forward with the largest facility. So that increased the recreational pool, the weight and cardio area, and the multi-purpose group fitness room. Uh, we also expanded around that time the um, based on program requirements for the competition pool. That space got a little bit bigger as well as the lobby area. So overall, the project grew a little bit since you saw it last time. Uh, the current area is closer to about 63,000 square feet. Um, I think when you looked at it last, it was about 56,000 square feet. Uh, parking has increased on the site from 163 total to 100 and I think we're at 80, 184 right now. So we'll show you that as we walk through. So we're currently in design development. So that's when we're getting into the project details, kind of finalizing what the building looks like both inside and out. We've held several meetings um, since we've last met with you, not only with our owner group, but also with our project advisory committee, the competition pool stakeholders, the Palisades neighborhood, um, the one community we have with you, as well as an online open house and a survey. So thank you all who've participated in that process because that really goes a long way in helping us um, inform the project and make it, make it better for you. Um, in addition, we've had our second pre-application meeting, and that's where we really got into the exterior building design, so we'll talk a little bit about that tonight. And yeah, let's get into it, I think. Pull up the site plan next. Oh, no, I'm not. Pull up site analysis, then we'll go to site plan and then building plan. So I left this slide in here because we had this in our, our original um, proposal to you back in at the end of February. And just again, locating everybody where we're at, we had located that buildable area down at the corner of the site, um, possible access points. Uh, again, the arrows not representing actual um, access points in every case, but just areas where streets connected um, around the site. And I'm gonna flip through the next one. Here we go, here's our site plan. Start with the site plan. All right, so starting at the streets along Stafford Road. So I, we talked a little bit about this, but this is starting to get fleshed out more. Um, proposed improvements, we're gonna have, and I think it's eight feet now. I think it was five before, but it's an eight foot landscape buffer along Stafford. And then that will connect to a 12 foot wide multi-use path. Um, and then landscaping and a public utility easement as it moves up the slope to the site. There'll be a new left turn lane. So that's down here as it um, hits the Stafford, Stafford uh, driveway. Um, and then that driveway into, into the site at Stafford will be reconstructed. So now it'll hit kind of perpendicular to the street and it'll have three distinct lanes two to exit the site and one to enter the site. So it'll be a lot safer um, than it is now. There's three pedestrian connections from Stafford. So you can see one with the brown shading uh, that will come across and up the site connecting to um, the path that leads to the main entry of the building. 
and then down at the corner to other two other crossings where it hits overlook um, one of those then well, both of them really will connect to that path uh, the new path that leads all the way to cloverleaf at the corner of the site you'll see some notes here about uh, stormwater management so we have a big stormwater management planter at the corner, as well as two smaller ones adjacent to the dry aisle. Those will manage any runoff from parking areas um, and will be landscaped and very nice, nice looking at features of the site and kind of a, a park-like con connection before you um, hit, the, hit the building. And all of those landscape planners um, are connected into the city storm system. So if there's ever uh, an overflow or a big event, then that gets carried away by the city storm system. Jennifer, if I can pause you for one second, we got a, a question from Claire uh, asking if you can tell us maybe just zoom out uh, for folks who have not been clued in or didn't attend the first meeting. Mm -hmm. The site is located where? It's Stafford Road oh, yeah. and... Go back. Go back. Yes. So yeah, so Stafford Road right here, Azalea Field, Lusher Farm, across the street and Overlook is right here and then Lake Ridge High School uh, to the left. Rustique Thank Park, if you're familiar, is gonna be down below. Is that right, Ken? Rustique's down here. Um, yeah. Okay, we've got nodding heads there. Cool, thanks for your question, Claire, and thanks, Jennifer, for clarifying. Yeah, sorry about that. All right. Stormwater, we're talking about stormwater. So moving into the site, like I um, mentioned before, we'll have uh, 184 spaces. So there's kind of three and a half rows in front of what is the aquatics portion of the building. And then basically two rows um, in front of the recreation and existing clubhouse building, which is up here. And then there's, um, as you come into the site, Drive a single drive aisle uh, will turn into two drive aisles. So those are utilized for fire access, they're utilized for drop off um, of kids or participants, um, as well as just through traffic through the site. And then that's bordered um, by pedestrian connections along the front of the front of the building that connect to those paths I talked about to Overlook um, and Stafford, as well as that connection to to um, the front entry and eventually to the site. Then you'll also see the new golf maintenance building. So we're not really talking about the golf course project today. Those are two separate projects, but this dashed line right here kind of represents our scope of work that it is just this corner. And then as many of you may know, the golf course also getting reconstructed. So the new golf maintenance building is over here at the end, which connects to our um, roadway and drive aisle system. And, and then, like I mentioned before, too, the, the existing clubhouse up here, it's going to be maintained, but also repurposed for more event spaces. Um, it's going to be connected with some new patio spaces um, right in front of the clubhouse that are adjacent to the golf course, as well as some bigger patio spaces that are around the new main entry, um, as well as the main entry plaza. You'll see a couple other brown spaces. So we're looking at some patio spaces off of the two pools facing the golf course. Um, and then some more on the front of the building where there are some event, um, event rental spaces and some meeting rooms. And then just to cover a little, talk a little bit about trees and earthwork, there will be quite a bit of um, earth moving and digging for this project, and that will affect trees. Um, existing trees are trying to be preserved wherever possible, but there, there will um, be a requirement to remove about two, uh, 120. Currently 20% of those are considered dead, hazardous, or invasive, and other range and condition from good to poor. Um, so the city requires mitigation of those trees. You can't just cut trees down. Um, and so those are uh, mitigated at a ratio of two to one replacement. Um, so the design as we're working on it now exceeds that requirement. So there actually be more trees on the site when we're done. 
Okay, I'm gonna flip to the plan. Allison, unless there's anything that came up, I'll just keep rolling. Yep, sounds good. Okay, so to get into the detail of the plan, this is a little bit rotated. So from that previous view, just to get your orientation, this is the aquatics wing and this is the uh, entry and dry recreation wing. So you can see the plan rotated a little bit, but that main entry plaza is right here and the clubhouse is to our right. So like I said before, it's about 63,000 square feet just under that. Um, coming up off of Stafford from the parking area, the main entry is right in the front here. And the idea with this front piece is it's very glassy and transparent, it has some really good connection to those patio spaces I've mentioned before. We're looking at having some garage doors. So these can really be sort of in and outside spaces. There'll be a separate golf entry on the golf course side. And then as you move into the space, staff offices in the upper corner, reception desk, and then moving into the dry um, recreation areas. So we'll have cardio and weight, weight room spaces, again, connecting to the golf course as much as we can, um, glass and views this way, group fitness space um, on the bottom, and then a gymnasium space right next to that. So that gymnasium can be divided in half as well. So there can be two courts, two activities occurring at one time. And then as you move down the hallway, you'll see locker rooms. So we're starting to enter that um, the wet area of the building. So the men's and women's locker rooms are on that golf course side. And then that hallway is connecting down through, through the building with visibility into the pool, um, the recreation pool right at the, at the end of the hall. Um, in addition to men's and women's locker rooms, we have a series of family changing rooms, several single occupancy restrooms, kind of a core of service spaces, so electrical and um, IT spaces, and then that event rental room, which I mentioned earlier with another um, patio space out in front. So moving down to recreation pool, uh, this is one of those features that grew with the with the council discussion discussion we had in June. So it was about 3,000 square feet and it grew to about 4,000 square feet. So it'll have space for lap swimming. Uh, this space can also be used for like water volleyball or swim lessons. Uh, this corner piece right here is sort of the shallower tot area. So we're looking at different water features to include in that space. All of these bodies of water are connected by a, a ramp. So this is a low sloping ramp. There's also additional stairs, access points into the pool. And then at this corner, then we'll have our, our feature slide. So I think the slide now is about 15 feet tall. So we'll have a stair and a tower and drop you down into uh, the water here. But the idea is to have lots of different um, spaces and activities, different ways to program it. Um, from lessons to just fun activities. Um, and then in the corner, you'll see a spa. So it'll be a built-in uh, hot tub spa in here as well. And those, both of these uh, aquatic spaces connect back to the building and the locker rooms right up here. So this would be this nice connection adjacent to the golf course where you enter the, enter the pools. And then continuing on into the competition pool. So this, this piece of it has really kind of stayed the same throughout or fairly, fairly close to the same. It's a 104 feet by 75 feet body water. We're looking at spectator seating for about 300. So there's gonna be some alternative options of where seating can move in here. We're working with the pool stakeholders on that. Have 12 to 13 cross course lanes. So you could have six lanes, uh, you know, two schools simultaneously, six lanes in uh, this direction. You could do similar with um, water polo to water polo courses. Um, it has a movable bulkhead in the center, so that can move and create um, swimming in this, in the other direction, or can create a much larger water polo course if the bulkhead is moved all the way down. So again, lots of options. Um, and flexibility with that, with that body of water. 
And then finally at the end, end of the plan, you'll see in that gray, this is a, the other kind of support end of the pool. So pool and the building. So pool mechanical, me building mechanical spaces, a bunch of space for storage, uh, laundry, restrooms for the facility as well. And then, like I mentioned, there will be a separate pool um, entry point that's off the parking lot. So if you're coming just for a meet or an activity, you can go right, uh, right in here to watch that. Jennifer, a couple of clarifying uh, questions yeah. on the pool. Carl's asking, how deep are the two competition pools? So it's just one body of water. Um, this bulk is actually floating, so you can move it. And it's it's not, um, it's around nine foot six for most of the pool. You can see a stair entry and ramp here. So I think it's um, nine feet right at this end, but overall the whole depth of the pool is about nine and a half feet. Um, and then Peggy had two questions that maybe we can ask answer now. Is it a 25 yard or 25 meter pool? Yard, 25 yard in this direction. And then the bulkhead, if you wanted to, you could park it in a 25 meter length um, from the wall on this end. Um, but so far that hasn't been desired from our pool stakeholders. So it's just a yard situation. Awesome. And then saline or chlorine water. And this might be getting really into the details, but <laughs> the anticipation of, of what that might be. It is a chlorine, it is a chlorine pool. Cool. We are doing it a little bit different. The chlorine, instead of um, bulk chlorine delivered to the to the building, which you see in a lot of pools, we'll have a chlorine generating system that will use salt tablets and convert it into chlorine. So it's a little bit safer um, for the operators to do it that way. Cool. Thanks, Jennifer. All right. We're going to move on to, to some fun exterior images next. And I'm gonna let Erica take over. I'll flip over to the next, next slide. Great. Okay, so we have some elevation images here. Um, the building consists of two larger masses. So we have the gymnasium and then the natatorium or pool building. And those tall masses have a concrete masonry base with vertical metal panel siding above. And the intent of that is just to create some, a lot more durability on the bottom and break up the verticality of those masses. Um, the vertical metal panel siding has multiple colors and uh, that's intended to break up the large expanse of wall and create some visual interest. Um, these volumes also have some tall window sections. So you can see at the gym, we have some windows at the corners. And then the pool building has a large window at the corner where the slide will be at the recreation pool to show off that amenity. Um, and then the, uh, the competition pool entry has a, has a big tall window there as well. So then the next sheet switches to the back side of the building. And uh, you can see we have some large windows on the, this, so this is the golf course side. Um, we have large windows with garage doors and some swinging doors that access that patio that Jennifer mentioned. And that's from both the recreation pool and the competition pool. And then there's a lower section of building that has light colored horizontal metal panel. And the intent of that is to relate to the clubhouse and that lower section of building kind of flows around those tall volumes. And then next we have some three-dimensional images so before I get started on these, I do want to just call out that these images are intended for a discussion on the building only. Um, the landscape is all diagrammatic. So you can see that there's a lot of green on the ground and that's not meant to indicate that there's grass everywhere. It's just to indicate that there's landscaping as opposed to paving, as opposed to concrete. Um, and then also we've, um, located a tree everywhere that a tree is proposed, but it doesn't mean that that's the exact species or the mature size of the tree. So this is really just intended for discussion on the building. So um, back to massing, you can see the clubhouse on the right side. And then you can see that the building has, this starts at the tall, tall volumes on the left side and then steps down as it approaches the clubhouse with the lobby and main entry being the shortest element. The rec center building has a similar setback from the street as the clubhouse. 
and the two buildings are directly tied together with an outdoor plaza. And then if you look kind of further off to the end of the building at the, the pool volume, you can see some solar panels on the roof. Um, and this, this project, we're not pursuing LEED certification or following the guidelines as much as, as much as we can. And we're working with the Lake Oswego sustainability team. Erica, for those of us who don't know, uh, what's LEED certification? Um, it's a standard of uh, categorizing how environmentally, um, how environmentally good a, a building is. Cool, thanks for that, I appreciate it. <laughs> Um, so the next image is a ground floor image, ground level image of the, the entry. So about the right half of this image is the, the lobby space and main entry. You can see that this has a small amount of horizontal metal panel, but it's mostly transparent and it's intended to blend the indoor and outdoor spaces and provide views. Um, the right side of the building, you can see all the way through it. There's glass all the way through, and that's intended to give views to the golf course. The roof structure has deep overhangs and is made of wood, and that's intended to give it some softness and um, relate this building to the clubhouse as well. And you can see that we've photoshopped a, um, a sculpture here at the entry, um, and that's one of the proposed sculptures for the project. And the project falls under the 1.5% requirement for art and we're working with the LO Arts Council. And then we have one more perspective image next. So you can see the clubhouse on the left side and the rec center lobby on the right side. And um, we have those big garage doors from the lobby out into the plaza space, um, just strengthening that connection. And then um, you can see, uh, as Jen mentioned, you can see uh, all the way from the hallway through the um, through the glassy lobby out to the plaza space and toward the clubhouse just to strengthen that connection as well. So that's the end of our images for the exterior. All right, I think uh, I think passing over to Ken. Talk about traffic and parking. I am here for that. Yes. <laughs> Do you want the site plan up, Ken, or should I just close out down our share? No, I don't think uh, we used the site plan as much in the last meeting. So I would like to uh, throw up our the Google Earth image. Oh, yeah. I think that, that, that was helpful. So if I can uh, share my screen here. Let me know if someone if you see it. Yep, that looks good. Cool. Um, so yeah, um, thanks for having me again. I did present uh, the traffic and parking studies at the neighborhood meeting. And for those who um, weren't there, I intend to talk about the same stuff as I covered in that meeting as well uh, to keep you awake. Um, I've added a couple more things in there based on uh, people's uh, a few comments. So you might hear a few things um, additional to that. I'll try to keep it. It probably will take, you know, probably 10 to 15 minutes to go to go through this, but I wanted to make sure that um, everybody hears the, the same information and a little bit more. So I have been practicing, you know, as a licensed civil engineer and on the uh, primarily, you know, on the west side of the Port of Metro for the last uh, 30 years or so. Um, so, and I also am the civil engineer for the golf course project. Um, so anyways, I'd like to run through the traffic and then the parking, and then hopefully we can do that before taking the, any questions and then I'll be here to answer as I can. So, uh, we did, we performed a, a traffic study to determine the impacts of the traffic that were generated by the new rec center, uh, rec and aquatic center, along with the golf course renovation. Uh, we looked at conditions before COVID and after construction, when the facilities are open and in use. And the study also looked at uh, nine nearby intersections from the Atherton roundabout north up to South Shore Boulevard and McVeigh. 
Um, we also performed a traffic study for the new proposed Rasik Park. Um, so the, the, the rec center uh, study also in, incorporated these effects, you know, of Rasik and, and the golf course. So you can see that uh, the intersections were looked, looked at in the corridor that's, uh, that we uh, talked to the, the city about making sure we cover um, the entire area. So uh, traffic counts were from 2018 and 2019. They were used as a baseline for the traffic volumes. Um, a conservative historical growth rate was used to estimate the, the base volumes. Um, so the, the, the COVID you know, pandemic was you know, factored in and adjusted based on the historic numbers prior to COVID. So you could say that you know, none of the COVID traffic was, it was basically ignored through this period of time because it would be false, as would be pretty obvious. So, um, and the growth rate, I think it was, as we worked with our traffic engineers with the city assumed a 1% a uh, conservative rate um, for the area. Um, Stafford has about 12,000 um, ADT, which is average daily traffic um, in this area. And, and the city's uh, code, you can probably see in there if you were to go and look at it, and they, minor arterials can handle 10 to 20,000 vehicles a day. So we're, we're definitely uh, above the, of the 50% and it will increase over the years um, as time goes by. So um, the rec center is anticipated to generate about 1,200 plus or minus new vehicle trips during a typical weekday, which will increase the traffic sum on Stafford. Um, the further north you go uh, from the site uh, towards up McVeigh, you know, the traffic will disperse out onto the, to the other roads. Uh, traffic volumes will continue to increase with or without the project. Uh, regional north-south traffic from, you know, I-205 north and down to Westland, all those areas um, up, go up into Portland, you know, affect the traffic and usage of Stafford Road. More people are, you know, using Stafford as, as in def, infill development occurs, um, more people are going there and the, in the neighboring communities. Um, downtown Lake Oswego, if you've been there, um, it continues to attract more people, uh, more as a destination place with restaurants and shopping and the outdoor spaces down there. Um, all the study and interaction, intersections will operate at an acceptable level of surface, less service um, after the projects are open, except for the Atherton roundabout in the PM peak hour. And that is generally, you could say four to six, but the five to 6 PM is the truly the peak. So, and this is under Clackamas County control. Um, just so you people know, um, the level of service is, it's a term that's, Use that it's qualitatively describing the operation operating conditions of a roadway, you know, based on the factors such as speed, uh, travel time, maneuverability, delay, and safety. Um, the level of service um, of a facility is designated with a letter from A to F, A representing the best operating conditions, and F being the worst. Um, so it, you know, it's important to point out that. The level of service F exists in today's conditions without the project and the rec center, and it's not ca the cause for failing. And this is at the, the Atherton roundabout in that PM peak hour. If you were to look at the AM peak, it's not even failing. It's a, a level of service D. If you look on Saturday, it's even it's much better than that. Uh, but people that live out there, they know the conditions, have seen it, gone through the different times. Um, so you know it's at level of service F today. But um, they are, these levels of surface um, are in the traffic report if you'd like uh, to look at specific intersections. Um, and then back in 2018, there was a road uh, safety audit that was done for Stafford Road in which these improvements were recommended uh, for Atherton Roundabout. And that would include adding a, essentially another lane around most of that roundabout. Um, and it would reduce the long queues on Stafford. But as everybody knows, should know that these roundabout improvements are not part of this project. Um, and so there's, and there's currently no capital improvement projects to upgrade the roundabout um, at this time. Um, time can, ch can change things, of course. So um, there have been some questions about traffic distribution up McVeigh and further as it goes to the south. And uh, 
So I want to touch briefly on this um, from the study. You know, we found that, uh, and this is working with the city engineering staff on the traffic side that, uh, uh, you know, the, the trips, the distribution of these trips are based on the review of the land uses within the study area, uh, based on existing traffic patterns and engineering judgment. So, um, and, and I'm not going to go into the details too much, but a couple of highlights in that 70% um, will or to and from it will be going to the north of the site, and fit beyond that, 50% to and from McVeigh, which is northeast of South Shore Boulevard. If you go to the south, this is expected at 30% distribution. Um, so moving on, the the existing driveway on on Stafford and the proposed new drive driveway off of Overlook will permit all the traffic movements. Um, Vehicle traffic uh, leaving the rec center, and the north way, north driver will have a, a separate north and southbound turn lanes for turning on the Stafford, and I think uh, Jennifer talk, touched on that as well. And I think they're about 100 feet long. So uh, Stafford road improvements uh, will include a new 100 foot northbound left turn lane going into that north access. So and this was increased earlier. Um, from 50 feet uh, in the earlier design. So uh, bikes and peds, pedestrians, um, facilities, you know, they're readily available with uh, bike facilities are kind of intermittent along Stafford and you know, required improvements along Stafford. Um, you know, Jennifer's already kind of touched on those, so I won't go into that. Uh, transit stops are about three quarters of a mile north of the rec center on South Shore. Um, and intersection site distance is typical. You have to look at any development. Uh, so we will look at it at overlook those driveways, make sure that it's uh, clear on both directions, all directions at an intersection. So there's a few questions, traffic questions that um, I'd like to touch on. And you could call them frequently asked questions if you want, but, um, and I'll give a, a response. So traffic along Stafford is already bad. What evidence is there that suggests will be able to support the additional traffic from the rec center. So the response is, you know, traffic study looked at the uh, current conditions pre-COVID, as I mentioned, and after construction, you know, determined that, you know, Stafford Road can accommodate the traffic from these improvements. Um, the roadway standards in the future, you know, they're determined by uh, local agencies, cities, counties, you know, through transportation system plans. Um, people call them TSBs. Uh, capital transportation projects, these agencies typically look out at 20 years uh, based on growth in the area, you know, to determine future project needs, um, such as would be for Stafford Road. Um, all nine of these intersections that were studied provide a, an acceptable level of service, uh, except for the PM peak at the roundabout, like I mentioned. Again, the, these, the data is in the traffic report, and which is on the project's website. Uh, next question, did the traffic study consider new upcoming larger developments along Stafford? So re codes require, the response is, uh, you know, codes res uh, require us to uh, new developments to study and to determine impacts created by their own development. And at the time of the study, there were no city approved uh, development projects in the area. Um, so will um, we'll tra traffic increase, you know, along the rec center? Due to the other developments, uh, it's possible depending on the development. And you know, you could talk about the new seasons up there, but that is part of their development to review with the city. Um, and it depends on their use, depends on their parking. So, um, like I said, park and rec. You know, we purposely looked at the traffic and parking impacts. You know, individually for these projects and collectively, you know, for the rec center, golf course, and seek park projects. You know, to to better understand the the impacts. Third question, um, how can the traffic counts, uh, counts data be correct if the reports were, you, were prepared during COVID? <clears throat> As I mentioned previously, the, the traffic engineers considered COVID and they were obviously down, um, but we pretty much, these volumes were adjusted prior to that and, and as of COVID hasn't, you know, didn't happen, so. Um, next question, the roundabout at Atherton, you know, can, it can't take any more traffic. So how will this be accommodated? And as I mentioned above, you know, it's a Clackamas County jurisdiction. 
they have the uh, over the roundabout and any capital improvements that would uh, go through the uh, through the county. So my suggestion is try to uh, and avoid it the roundabout during the the weekdays and the PM peak hours as if you can. Um, that's the the short term, I guess, until something happens in the future. Um, the last question: uh, We can ex can expect more traffic passing through lo local neighborhoods. So what considerations you know, have been given for this and concerns about overflow and parking in the neighborhoods? Response is, you know, the parking will be contained on site. It's planned for that. Uh, that was part of our parking study. Um, it is less likely people will park in the surrounding neighborhoods. I'm not gonna say it won't happen for, you know, there are people that may try to avoid Stafford Road and you could get some people that wanna drop people off over there. Um, but you know, has, you know what's planned for you know a lot of the a larger events is is the overflow parking and that Hazelia Field, uh, which is the closest um, for large you know events, then followed by the you know the high school, and then potentially as well down at, at the church. Um, so then direct pedestrian access is also being designed to overlook for safe crossings and connections. Um, some of the additional strategies, you know can be employed as no parking signs, um, which is uh, one way parking, you know, could be managed. Um, so anyways, I just want to touch on some of this, those questions. Moving on to the uh, parking study we did. Um, so we did it again for the golf course and rec center combined. We used the city standards, uh, industry data and local comparison sites. Um, the, again, the study did not use data during COVID. Uh, for the rec center, um, the city has a land use code for a set ratio of the number of parking stalls to the gross floor area per 1,000 square feet of the buildings for recreation type facilities. Uh, we compared this requirement with other similar facilities around the Portland metro area and confirmed by calling and talking with them, uh, the managers, the people that work there and run it. and how their parking lots uh, function during these the, their peak hours of usage. Um, so from our research, the city's code, you know, it does appear to be on the side of requiring fewer spots rather than, you know, large underused parking lots. And so we used a, a ratio that was uh, slightly above the, the city's code. Uh, for the golf course, um, it doesn't have a required code for golf courses. However, there are a national ITE uh, standards um, and that IT is Institute of Transportation Engineers. This is common um, for engineers. Um, and with parking generation data, which is again commonly used, it, it contains golf course data um, and a variety of nine holes, eight holes, or 18 holes, a variety of data. So we've uh, we use that to, to help in determining the, uh, the parking spaces during peak hours. Um, like the rec center, we contacted golf courses to confirm data. Um, you know, existing peak use for the 18 hole course was approximately 75 spaces and the nine hole course is not, not expected to increase this amount. Um, the estimated number of, uh, for the new nine hole uh, course, you know, may oversupply the uh, golf course uh, peak period, but it'll, it'll help with uh, the combined rec center parking. Um, is, you know, if you've golfed, you should know that, uh, you know, you sometimes in 18 hole courses, you can get, you might be able to play off the back nine, get started there, gets more people on the courses. Well, with a nine hole course, you know, there's no back nine, obviously. So, you know, fewer people can actually be on the course compared to an 18 hole course. So, um, in combination of both of the uses, the rec center and the golf course, uh, we then compared the peak use times and the overlap of the usage, you know, to determine what parking could be shared uh, to come up with a final number of, of parking spaces. Um, in addition, you know, we also considered the use of, again, as mentioned, the other adjacent large facilities for uh, these big events um, that may require additional parking. Um, and Jennifer mentioned, uh, you know, this, uh, there's 184 spaces in the in the design right now to handle this. Um, so bicycle parking, touch on that, you know, uh, 16 bike parking spaces are required to meet city code. We have 20 proposed. Uh, and I do know based on the comparison of other sites, 
Um, bicycle parking is very underused and therefore is expected to be low here as well, but we are meeting the code, so it should be sufficient. Um, you know, I think just lastly, um, mentioned this last time, but in closing, um, city code does require and dictate our approach to these projects. Um, the city engineering staff will review the land use plans and documents that have been prepared, and they do have the authority to require making changes or additions um, to what you're seeing in the in the plans today. Um, on the personal side, I know people don't like traffic, increased traffic and congestion, uh, myself included. It's uh, it's easy to complain when we can't find a parking spot somewhere or, or we view an open parking lot as a big waste of, of space. Um, but I think it's important for people to think about others who desire this, these facilities and will get to use and experience them for, for years to come. So um, city residents, they voted these projects in and with the 2019 bond measure. Um, so I think we need to be thankful that, you know, the other cities which are near as fortunate to provide and then, to have such high quality parks and rec center facilities for the residents. So that's on the personal side. So thanks for listening. Back to back to you, Allison. Thanks, Ken. Um, Jennifer, just checking, did we, was that our final uh, presentation piece or did we have more to cover? Yeah, I think that's it. Cool. All right, folks, well, let's uh, get into your questions. Again, the Q&A is open. So go ahead and type out your questions. Uh, and we'll take some of them uh, now. So I, I want to thank um, Ivan for answering some of the questions. And we may be going in and typing out answers to your questions. And actually, Ivan, if I could have you introduce yourself. Uh, you joined during the presentation, but you might be taking some of these as well. And just let us know who you are and what your role is on the project. Hi, everyone. Um, Ivan Anderholm. I'm the Parks and Recreation Director. And I'm also part of the project team. Awesome. Thanks, Ivan. And another special guest, Megan. Megan Big John, would you like to say hello this evening? Megan may join us in a second. It's cool. We'll get there. All right. Uh, so there was a question that uh, Ivan kindly answered already, but let's talk a little bit about light and windows. So one question uh, that Claire asked was, you know, have you thought about bird strikes with large windows? And Ivan kindly answered that uh, the team is looking at window treatments and etching to reduce bird strikes. Um, we also had another question about natural light coming into the pool area. So I'm curious, team, if you can tell us a little bit more about the kind of lighting that's in there right now, windows, doors, what are, what are we looking at with lighting in the pool area? Uh, VCAM also noted that teaching in the current pool is like working in a basement. So it sounds like the lighting is a little less than ideal. Uh, any thoughts on windows, lighting, and what we're looking at uh, for this new pool? We can definitely vouch for the basement feel. We went, uh, we attended a water polo practice on Monday and it's pretty dark in there. So <laughs> not the best. Um, Erica, do you want to talk about light in the pool specifically? I think we've kind of done some research on it. Yeah. Um, so specifically about daylighting, um, uh, glare in, in the pools is a, is a pretty big safety hazard and a big consideration. Um, so we had done some preliminary daylighting studies and found that this, because uh, the natatorium is facing pretty close to, to due south, and um, to be able to really eliminate the glare in those pools, uh, we would have to have very deep overhangs and, um, and exterior sun shading devices, which would add a lot of cost. Um, so uh, glare in the pools is an issue. It can get into, um, it can, it can conflict with the athletes, uh, abilities to, to, to compete. And it can be a major safety hazard because it will, it can reflect off of the water and make it so that a lifeguard can't see under, see someone trapped underneath the water. Um, but yes, the, uh, the interior of the pool will be lit with, um, It'll be it'll be fully lit. We have a lighting designer on the team. Um, it'll it'll have good quality lighting. Thanks, Erica. A lighting designer sounds super cool. Jobs you didn't know existed, or maybe you all knew that they existed. I didn't. Uh, there was another question from Claire asking about trees. 
which is another part of this. Um, Claire was asking if decisions have been made regarding what kinds of trees might be on the site, whether they'll be mature trees. Uh, and Ivan also answered this one saying that uh, mitigation trees will be native and we will incorporate different sizes. Uh, anybody want to say anything else about trees or landscaping? I don't think we have anybody from the landscaping team on the call, but I know that y'all are talking a lot about trees and landscaping. So anything else we want to add into the mix? I think I haven't covered it pretty well, but yeah, we are we are just getting into the details of that and we're even have some more uh, targeted meetings with the owners next week to talk about landscaping in particular. So that's definitely part of the design development and getting into the details of the project. Cool. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, there was a question from Kathleen that came through earlier. Uh, Erica, you talked a little bit about LEED certification, but is there a reason why the team is not pursuing uh, LEED certification for this building? And Erica, that doesn't need to be you that answers it, but uh, maybe anybody on the team don't want to put you on the spot here. <laughs> Yeah, actually, I can I can take that one. Um, so first off, LEED stands for Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design, and it's been around for probably almost 20 years now as a certification process. And early on with LEED, uh, a lot of projects were LEED certified, and there's a whole process you go through to do that. And what we've seen now is that there's more of a focus on doing the work that LEED has brought forward in terms of energy and environmental design and less on the certification process um, because there's a process you have to go through and it costs money and all of those things to actually certify a project. So this project, we started with a uh, sustainability charrette um, where we talked about what are the goals uh, for the project in terms of sustainability, prioritize those, and we're really using that to guide the design of the project. Now, if we were to lead certify, and we use lead the, the checklist, there's actually a checklist that breaks it into a whole bunch of components uh, from site design to daylighting to um, high efficiency uh, HVAC systems and all those kinds of things, um, that this project would most likely be a lead plus project, um, you know, in terms of um, the kind of materials we're using and, and the, the kind of systems. So really it's more of, yes, we're, we're, I think there's really a push on sustainability here, but not on the certification process. And Ivan might be able to speak more to that about the city's view on the actual certification process. And part of it too, and hi, Kathleen, out there, I know, I know you're in the watching, and, and you're more astute than I am on on the the uh, city uh, guidelines for sustainability in in design and in buildings. So we're fully um, applying those standards that that were um, uh, adopted by our city council, and we are using LEED as the the guiding um, documents and, and checklists, like Sid said, uh, in order to to make decisions as we're moving forward. Um, we are actually in the near future, now that we're at 50% DD, um, we are uh, convening a group with our sustainability manager at the city, um, our sustainability advisory board, and the Lake Oswego uh, Sustainability Network, and we'll be going through the project um, with the plans on specifically uh, what our sustainability goals were. Um, what we have incorporated into the project, and then asking for feedback on that, and also looking to if there are other things or different things that we should be emphasizing than we are um, in, in the design at the 50% um, design development. So that's um, right around the corner. I expect that meeting to happen within probably the next couple weeks. Um, and uh, obviously we'll, we'll let the greater public know um, that we're having that meeting and so that we can sit down and have that discussion and, and go through the finer points of, of what we're doing in the design. Thanks, Sid, and thanks, Ivan. All right, Sarah. Um, Sarah, thanks for joining us. And we did not talk about pathways quite yet, so or we maybe touched on them, but uh, Sarah has a 
a comment and uh, a question. And I'm going to try and summarize some of the comments and design team. I think a lot of you are reading the things that are coming through. Uh, but Sarah's question is really about the experience of their kids um, and you know, connecting the Sunny Hill neighborhood to both the rec center and to Lake Ridge High School. And uh, Sarah's noting that you know, there had been some original talks about extending a pathway. Uh, and they're asking, has consideration been given to a pathway around the perimeter of the golf course to connect the Sunny Hill neighborhood? Um, is it possible to, uh, to extend a neighborhood pathway from the street to the golf course to give all Sunny Hill students easier pedestrian access to the high school? Uh, maybe we can say a little bit more about paths. If anybody on the call can, can say more about that. And this is kind of getting into the golf course again. We're not talking a ton about the golf course tonight, but it's all on the same property. Ken, you unmuted. Is this you? Well, it could be Ivan too, but I'll, I'll jump on this a little bit as the as the civil engineer. Um, I'm going to share my screen again because I think it may be helpful. Everybody can see it? Yep. Okay. We can see that. So so I think the resident that was talking about, um, sorry, I forgot their name, but they live at the end of Clara Court here. So I think there's some considerations. Um, uh, you know, there's different opinion, opinions from different people, different neighborhoods about traffic in their neighborhoods. You, know, you could talk about the neighborhood over here and not maybe wanting the traffic over there. But if you were to look at, to zoom in here and look at the houses and older subdivision, there's clearly no spaces in here to put a path in between these houses. Maybe further down towards the intersection, but you're that close, uh, probably you wouldn't be able to access going through a cemetery either. So you're pretty much at Stafford to go down that route, which is the current route. The only route that they can go is to head down Sunny Hill, down to down Stafford to the to the site. And when you look up here, I think they offered um, access down here at the end of their property. Um, engineering wise, all things are feasible. It's just a amount of uh, money <laughs> that they may not be there for that, but it would probably be pretty significant to put a path down along the creek with bridges and the environmental side. Um, and then to consider running it, whether you head east down, down one side of the drive range or you connect it over heading to the west and tie in the Banyan Lane over there, there's options. Um, time and money, but this this is not uh, part of the project. Uh, land use would control what is required. Um, there is the path down at the south end of the prop property um, that's in the plans. It, it's shown on the site map. That would be a, a condition that's required for pedestrian connectivity to the, to the neighborhood over here and to the rec center. But going back up in here, could it feasibly work? Yeah but there will bring a lot of challenges to it. The other thing is safety. Um, we purposely have kept the, the path down at the south end, separated along the path and partially into the, uh, the high school property to stay away from the golfers and, and for the safety end of things. So um, if you go north, they also there's this big patch of wetlands through here. So you would probably would not, I guess you could do something through that would be a challenge, but feasible. But there's the safety with people walking along over here um, along the perimeter with the whole golf course. So uh, there's multiple factors in, included in this. So that's my take. Thanks, Ken. Uh, I want to note that Sarah's noting that there's uh, already a neighborhood trail on their property, but it sounds like there's from kind of the, the city jurisdictional perspective, some uh, you know potentially significant hurdles to getting that to be an official uh, path connecting the sites. So thank you for illuminating some of those. Ivan, I don't know if you want to add to add anything there or Ken covered most of it. Uh, yes, Ken, Ken covered most of it. And um, I'm pretty familiar actually with, with the trail that Sarah's talking about that's on her property. Um, and I see here in the questions too that she's asking about will there be a chain link, chain link fence surrounding the new golf course? And the answer to that is yes, with the exception of really the uh, recreation center side um, will be open. Um, it'll be a little bit different in that that parking area for the recreation and aquatic center will be open. Um, there won't it won't be a gated off um, parking uh, such as it is now, and then. Obviously, we are working on strategies 
in those gaps between the buildings and um, at the service entry where the golf uh, maintenance facility and the uh, back of house portion of the aquatic center of how to keep vehicles from just driving from the parking lot out onto the golf course. So we, we are working on strategies for that, but as far as the north end, um, the west end, uh, the east end of the, um, the golf course, as well as um, between the golf course and Lake Ridge High School, we are anticipating that there will continue to be a fence um, um, on those. And primarily it's to keep people from walking out onto the golf course and, and uh, walking into a, da a dangerous situation. Thanks, Ivan. Uh, thank you, Sarah, for your generous offer. Uh, to give folks a tour if they'd like to know more. We'll also be sure that you get contact information of who you can get in touch with. Sounds like there might be some specifics to your question that you may wanna to talk directly uh, to somebody about. So we will drop those into the chat uh, before the end of our meeting today. Thank you so much for your questions. Um, okay, there is another question from one of our attendees. Will non Lake Oswego residents have access to the facility? And if so, would their access be considered a revenue source for the city? Who wants to take this one? Is this a is this a Jan? Is this a Jan? It, 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 it could be a Jan or Ivan. I'll I'll try and then Jan can, <laughs> can weigh in. Um, the the short answer is yes. Um, non residents will have access to the facility. Um, but with all of our programs that we offer through Lake Oswego Parks and Recreation, um, we do offer those. Um, as both a secondary opportunity to get enrolled if it's an enrollment class. So we give priority to Lake Oswego residents. Um, and then non-residents um, are charged a uh, premium for that. So they, they do actually uh, pay more than uh, the residents do for the same services. So and that is our anticipated model for, for this facility. Um, so any of the memberships, any of the classrooms, any of the swim lessons, um, any of the drop-in activities, we are anticipating that there will be a price differential for LO residents and non-residents. Thanks, Ivan. Jan, anything to add? Did he cover it? He covered it. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> thanks, Ivan. And thanks, Jan. Uh, I want to note that Selena is also saying that they're here for the Sunny Hill Pathway. So it sounds like there's some interest uh, out in the community on that pathway connecting the neighborhood. So thank you for that. Um, and again, we may there may be some specificity there. Uh, so we'll be sure that you get um, contact information to, to chat directly with folks too. Um, Jeff had a question that, uh, let me find it. I know that Ken answered. Um, Jeff was asking, has the impact of tolling on I-205 have been factored into the traffic analysis? And Ken answered that no. Um, and Jeff, I know that you're really clued into um, transportation goings on around the region. So uh, looks like some additional comments on uh, tolling on, on 205, but sounds like that has not been taken into account uh, considering the, the timing of that and, and when that could be looked at uh, in, in how it relates to this project. But thank you, Jeff, for bringing that up. Um, all right, let's see, Julie just got a question. Let me take a look and see if I can summarize this for our panelists. Okay, Julie, uh, looking at emissions and uh, thinking about increased traffic, and uh, some of the increased emissions that'll be potentially impacting the community due to more, uh, more cars and more vehicle traffic. Uh, Julie would love to see it more of a push for electric vehicle spaces, for e-scooter availability, uh, and a campaign for community to bike to the site versus drive. Um, and just noting that there's a lot of different community amenities nearby and uh, parking seems excessive, uh, but wasn't sure how the site will uh, bear you know, kind of all those folks coming for an event. Can anybody on the team maybe say a little bit more? Has any consideration been given for, for things like, you know, e uh, electric vehicle spaces, charging stations, um, bicycle parking or bike, bike connectivities uh, to address some of those concerns? Um, we have definitely talked about electric vehicle spaces, and I think that'll be something we talk more about uh, this. LO sustainability group as well. Um, so yeah, I think we definitely will have will have those. Um, overall parking, I don't know, Ken mentioned it a little bit, but um, 
we are sizing that lot for most of the day-to-day -day use, not for large events and any, any really large events or swim meets or water polo matches, there will be overflow onto some of those adjacent sites that Ken mentioned. So Pazelia Field being the closest and uh, the high school next door um, and possibly the church. So it does look like a really large lot. It, it is pretty large, but it's a really large building and there's a lot of um, you know, high occupant spaces in there. So we're trying to strike a balance by not part paving everything, but not putting a burden on the neighborhood. Thanks, Jennifer. And I'll add to that on the, the parking situation and the electric, um, parking for electric vehicles. If you've had a chance to uh, visit the new city hall and especially the upper parking lot and even the lower parking lot at the city hall, um, although we haven't incorporated that into the design, um, I envision that there will be the same um, type of reserve parking for um, hybrid low emission vehicles um, that'll be highlighted with green markings in, in the parking spaces so that we're encouraging those folks um, and actually, um, in some cases, giving those folks um, some of the prime parking spaces um, for the facility. So we're just entering into that discussion of, of how that's all going to lay out. But um, I, I would venture to say that it's going to be very similar to the new city hall parking lot when, when you're talking about um, encouraging people both with electric and low emissions vehicles to, to use those vehicles when visiting the facility. Thanks, Ivan. Uh, on that note, let's go with Claire's question. Claire asked, um, perhaps I heard this incorrectly, but I thought somebody mentioned public transportation along Stafford Road. And they note that there is no public transportation right now on Stafford Road. Any thought about, about public transportation since traffic is bound to increase and exacerbate a bad situation, especially if the Stafford Triangle happens? I know that's kind of out of scope for what this project is. We're touching on a lot of different ways that uh, city and regional um, pieces touch, you know, infrastructure projects like this or uh, community projects like this. But Ken, yes, tell us more about public transportation. <laughs> I'll tell you what I know, but um, yeah, I mean, this is a more of a TriMet uh, area of, of expertise as far as the routes and I mean, they look at the ridership everywhere. Um, from my understanding, there is one up at McVeigh and South Shore. Um, that's what I've been told. I can't confirm it, but that's in our traffic state, so I assume it's there. Um, but yeah, future routes, um, they, they can change, um, but it's more TriMet driven um, for any future changes. And I know that the uh, city has had conversations with TriMet about expansion of services in, in different areas. And TriMet has a matrix that they use that they determine when they're going to open up new routes. Um, it, the interesting thing is with the Stafford Triangle, with the potential tolling down on um, I-205 uh, development to the south, um, I know that the city that we have talked to, to TriMet directly about bus routes that would go beyond South Shore, because at this time the bus routes uh, come up McVeigh and they turn west on South Shore and that that's the extent of their routes. Um, really, it's one of those where we've been told by TriMet that they put the information they put the potential ridership and destinations into their matrix and then make their decisions based on that. Um, so uh, the city is aware of it. The city um, does um, participate. Um, um, and I can't remember the name of the group, TMAC, GMAC, RMAC. Um, it's one of those, but we do participate in that. And so we are at the table when considerations are being made for um, enhanced public transportation. Um, in and around and through uh, Lake Oswego. Thanks, Ivan. Okay, let's take Carolyn's question and talk about a little bit different kind of bus. Uh, did the traffic study consult with Lake Oswego School District on their bus routes? Historical difficulties uh, exiting the buses going to Lake Ridge High School make the left-hand turn off of Burgess. Sounds like there's some difficulty there with the bus routes. Ken, yeah. tell us more. Um, yeah, so I, I don't know specifically if our traffic engineers talked talk to Tony in the school district about it, but I mean, 
when you look at this, the routes with the schools, that is all considered in there in the traffic data um, that comes from the area. It's like we looked at the intersection over there near the school. Um, and uh, forgive me if I want to say, I think it's a uh, treetop, treetop lane, overlook drive and, and Meadowlark. Uh, so we looked at that and I mean, yes, the ex levels of service are, are acceptable there easily at that intersection, but speaking to, to Burgess, I know that was one of the intersections in the traffic study. Um, and I, I don't disagree that, you know, the buses may have difficulties making it out with the traffic. It, um, at this point, though, Burgess is not a does not have warrants to add a traffic signal at that intersection. That can change in the future, but uh, you know, during the study, uh, it's not warranted. Um, there are some improvements uh, that could be recommended, but um, for the intersection, that's more pedestrian related, but bike and ped related. But I'd be up to the city's traffic um, staff if if they want to uh, require any improvements there, but. Signalization, yeah, it's not uh, warranted there at that, that at the Burgess intersection. So, thanks, Ken. And uh, if you couldn't see Ivan's face, I saw him nodding along to a lot of that. So, it sounds like uh, we're right on track with the consult, uh, the review of, of the bus routes for the school district. Okay, let's switch gears a little bit. Uh, Anne has a question, uh, and folks, I'm going to encourage you if you've got questions, get them in the Q and A. They're slowing down, but I, I'm guessing that there's still a few more out there. Um, so get them in the Q&A and we can certainly take them now. But Anne's asking about uh, earthquake preparedness and seismic resiliency. So maybe, and it sounds like Anne uh, knows quite a bit about how buildings can be uh, prepared for earthquakes. So their question is, to what level of earthquake preparedness is the new space being built? Will it be at least at the life safety level? Might it be done at the better immediate, immediate occupancy level? And maybe uh, whoever wants to take this one, if you can explain a little bit about what some of those terms mean uh, for folks who might not be as up to date with seismic resiliency. Jennifer? I don't know if I know exactly, but I know, I know enough. Um, so we have talked about resiliency a little bit on the building um, and the, the, what I described as the dry land or the dry recreation portion of the building will be constructed to immediate occupancy standards. So that's a level four um, in the structural building code. The rest of the building um, is level three. So I don't know if that's considered life safety. To me, it's life safety. That is required by the code. And um, it's pretty stringent as well, just because of the area that we're in. So um, that front portion of the building will be constructed to immediate occupancy standard. Thanks for that, Jennifer. And thanks, Anne, for your question. Okay, we got a comment um, from Jeff in there about uh, some of the impacts from tolling. Thanks for those, Jeff. We're going to capture those. Okay, we've got another uh, question. Let me give me give me a second to read it. Ooh, this is a pool question. All right, folks. Uh, so VCAN says that they currently run the high school swim meets. Will there be enough space to have a crow's nest for electronic timing? And where will the scoreboard uh, be located? There needs to be space for the starter and for the athletes to pass by during a swim meet on the deck. The, the Shehalem pool in Newburgh has a spot at the top of the bleachers, but is slightly small. Uh, I know we've got a few other pool people in the audience. So thanks for being here and for uh, doing cool pool stuff. I love swimming. I love swimmers. It's fun high school activity. Jennifer, can you tell us more? We did just talk about this last night. So we had a pool stakeholder meeting last night and we got into that detail, all of those details, where the scoreboards can be located. There's a couple options uh, where the seating can be located. We're really looking at a lot of configurations with this pool. So what we talked about last night was having some flexibility with seating and how we can move it to, to the best spots. Um, so all of that is under consideration right now and in development. Um, we did talk about uh, meat management and where that would be located. Right now, we're looking at different spots along the deck on a raised platform that can be moved around uh, depending on the meat configuration. We looked a little bit about an elevated crow's nest. We don't have the same kind of scenario as the Shehalem pool, and we do need those locations to be at various spots on the deck. So it's a little harder to have that one 
elevated spot that that works. Um, so right now we're looking at that on the deck in in various locations. Did I cover everything? I think so. Yeah, I think so. Okay, folks. Um, we do have this time held until eight o'clock, but I'm thinking if questions are starting to uh, slow down, we may wrap up a little earlier tonight. Um, we're a pretty small meeting space, and I know that there's at least one person who's calling in, so maybe we'll just do a quick, like, see if there's any hands out there of anybody who needs to share a question verbally, and we can take, um, you know, a couple of, of verbal questions from folks. So if you do want to, um, you have a question that you have not been able to ask in the Q&A, and you'd like to share that verbally, I'm especially looking at you, call in person, you can raise your hand digitally, or you can press star nine on your phone. Uh, if that's if you are on your phone, and that'll raise your hand, and we can get your question. And I'm going to hold a little bit of awkward silence while we see if we do have any uh, hands raised. But maybe team, as we start to as our questions sort of start to dry up, and uh, hopefully folks are just really excited and jazzed about the Recreation Aquatic Center, the pools, and all the fun activities that Jana's going to run there. Uh, maybe we can talk a little bit about what's next uh, for folks so they can know. What's going to happen after this? We've touched on it in our presentation, but it might be a good wrap up. Okay, I was looking for hands and I'm not seeing any. And I'm not seeing any more questions come into the Q&A. So maybe Jennifer, can you tell us a little bit more about what happens next and any next steps for folks? I think you're going to go off and do a lot more work to make things happen, right? We're definitely doing a lot more work. <laughs> a lot more work and I, I didn't show the last slide in our presentation is just a reminder to check the website so we are trying to be a lot better about posting updates there so we'll probably um now that we've had a neighborhood meeting recently as well as this meeting there'll be some updates just the summaries from both of those meetings will appear I think you put recording links too I can't remember but um and then we'll update uh plan plans and uh renderings as we get those as well um, and then I think, you know, Bruce Powers is our project manager for the whole project. He was unable to attend because I think his power went out. Someone told us his power went out right before. <laughs> um, Allison, are you able to put his contact info in the chat too, or I can? Because um, he's really the one that's collecting everything um, and, and then distributing it out to the team. So he, he sends those questions to us. Um, but he's our, our point of contact. Um, yeah, there it is. So yes, if we didn't answer sufficiently or if you have other questions, um, there's the plans a little bit outdated from what I showed today, but pretty close and we will update those. But they're on the website now. So if you want to look at them closer um, on your own time, that'd be awesome. Give us more questions, comments. Um, that's really it. We're, uh, like we talked about, we're in that design development phase. We're gonna be doing another cost estimate. We're always checking um, our budget uh, consistently as we go through and develop the work. And then our next milestone will be submitting for a land use application. Thanks. And Jennifer, I think you talked about this, but big picture, when, are, when would the team be looking at things like construction, like opening, I know that's, what is time? <laughs> what is time? Just, if folks missed it, what, what's the timeline for those? <laughs> That's the other thing Bruce and I are working on is getting a, a real schedule put up on that website so you can so you can see where we're at. Um, because we still have we still have some things to go through and I don't want to commit to anything right now and then have that be false. So look for that on the look for that on the website. I appreciate your candor, Jennifer. <laughs> so folks can uh, stay updated more. Uh, by checking out the website. I just put the website into the chat. Bookmark it. Check in regularly. You'll see a meeting summary from this meeting and a recording as well. Uh, so keep in touch. We also have contact information for Bruce Powers uh, and his phone number and email address. If you have very specific concerns uh, that you'd like to get in touch and talk through or questions that weren't able to be answered tonight, uh, let us know. I see, I see a hand from Ken and I see Maybe one other question. So we'll take uh, as the final call for questions. And Ken, go for it. No, I just saw that. So I thought I'd try to raise the hand thing. I haven't used before. So it was just it was just regarding the uh, 
the additional comment. So yeah, um, thanks I won't um, answer that one. <laughs> it's okay. We it's too bad we don't have emojis in this meeting. Those are those are the funnest part of Zoom meetings. Okay, so we had a question: Is there a space outside for athletes to have dry land exercise uh, or a place to run outside activities? Do we have any outside activities? We do have patio space outside of that rec, uh, both the rec pool and the competition pool. Um, we haven't talked specifically about what uh, program activities could happen there, but I think that definitely could be used for uh, dry land training for swimmers, water polo. Cool, thanks Jennifer. I think too, when you look at the um, configuration of the deck spacing and how we're looking at accommodating um, spectators and, and the possibility of having some flexibility is that we'll have the opportunity to open up, especially during practice sessions, um, a lot of open deck space, um, actually a lot, like twice what you'd normally see next to a pool um, that, that can accommodate some of that as well. And of course, you know, in, in situations where there's, you know, specific uh, workouts and things that, that happen dependent on the other programming within the building. There's a, an opportunity, there will be some opportunities for dry land um, for um, the student athletes in, in the other portion of the facility as well. Thanks, and I know that, that uh, the possibility of opening up those spaces to the outside got a lot of love uh, from our uh, committee members. And I know some committee members are out there in the audience today. So thank you so much. And it was also a topic that came up in our last uh, community meeting way back in February. Um, okay, another, we'll maybe do another question. I think we're gonna wrap it up at 7.30. So get your questions in if you can. With that, with that uh, does, do those dry recreation pieces, and I think we're talking about inside space, does that include uh, recreation space for yoga classes and for dance classes? Jan's nodding. Jan, tell us more. Yes, we are going to have a, a group exercise room. It's about 2,000 square feet with some storage for multi-uses. Dance, yoga, tai chi, all kinds of programming. Very fun. Thanks, Jan. Mm -hmm. Okay, folks, I can see thing, people are starting to drop off of our call. Uh, but thank you so much for your questions this evening. Again, you have contact information. Um, oh, okay, Jeff, I see you getting in your question right at the final minute. Apologies if this was addressed, but what are the plans with the current pool once the new one is built? Ivan, is this an Ivan question? My understanding, and actually this is this would be a good uh, Tony or Beth who are both um, representatives of Lake Oswego School District that are on our design team that couldn't be here tonight. Um, but my understanding is that um, in the district's previous master planning process for Lake Oswego High School, um, they have um, plans for where the existing pool is and it won't, won't be a pool. So um, the idea is to take that pool out and then repurpose that space um, for other purposes. And um, for more information on that, you can go to the Lake Oswego School District site and look at their projects page. Um, and I do believe that they have their conceptual concepts of um, Lake Oswego High School campus. So, Thanks, Ivan. Um, I am always continually impressed by the ability of our panelists to respond to questions on the fly. So thank you all panelists for uh, just illuminating and sharing um, your knowledge and hopefully getting folks excited about the Recreation and Aquatic Center that is coming to your community in Lake Oswego. Okay, uh, yes, uh, I, there'll be more information posted on the website, Julie, stay in touch and check that uh, the, the first website that I put into the chat, that's the project page specific to the Recreation and Aquatic Center. I think you can uh, be you can anticipate to see something like an FIQ or more additional information uh, coming up on the website. Uh, so with that, I'm going to stop the recording and wish you all a wonderful rest of your evening. Thank you so much for joining us.